Well, thank you very much and, and welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, first of all, I've got no conflicting interest to Claire during this talk. Um, and this is where I spend 50% well, of my time. This is St Mary's Hospital. Um, I remember this photograph being taken and it was pouring with rain. So I have no idea how it came out with blue skies, but that seems to be whenever you show a picture of a hospital, it has to have a blue sky behind it. But this is the, the major trauma centre there, and that, that's where I spent about 50% of my time. And, and there, it's these type of head injuries that we're really dealing with, the, the really serious, the big ones, um, rather than the more minor ones. And I've used that term with uh, trepidation as we go through this talk, because they're not necessarily minor. Um, my rest of my time is spent here. This is the training ground at Chelsea Football Club, and there's a huge um, difference between the NHS and what goes on at Chelsea Football Club. But here, if I was to CT and MRI the head injuries, which we do occasionally, um, they're going to be normal. And the radiologists around you in the room will realise these are normal scans. I'm not trying to catch anybody out. But those would be where, where they scans, and that's the majority of the things that we're talking about. I'm going to come back to these sort of structurally normal head injuries, and that sort of theme going through this talk. Concussion in sport appears to be growing, and I say appears because we know that there are an increasing number of people participating in sport, which is a good thing, therefore we'd expect the number of head injuries in some of those high-risk sports to go up. But I think this also reflects the recognition, um, and I think we're recognising concussion much more, and the publicity is out there about recognising it. So the reporting of concussion has got a lot better um, as a virtue of that. But I think, I think the instance is also going up at the same time. The trouble with concussion is how do we actually define it? What, we, what do we say concussion is? And if we take a sort of word cloud of, of um, different symptoms that people see as being related to concussion, we have a whole host of different things. I'm still not quite sure what getting your bell rung means, unless it's some sort of virtue of the head hitting things, but anyway. Um, but those, those are the sort of symptoms that people come up with when they're relating to what concussion is. But is there any other way that we can do that? Well, the only real way when you haven't got um, something you can actually MRI or structurally define is to get together a whole group of experts. And, and that's what they did in terms of getting uh, a group of people together, a concussion in sport group. Um, and what they did was to come up with what they felt were the symptoms that went with concussion. So the important ones really to come out, out of here really are those sort of somatic headache type of ones, but also there are some physical signs potentially, but not all the time in terms of loss of consciousness or neurological deficit. But the ones which I think are coming out much more now are around balance impairment, behavioural changes, and also cognitive impairment. And I do want to come back to that, and I will come back to this in terms of slowed reaction times. And I think some of the underestimated ones, which is the sleep-wake disturbance as well, and a lot of patients you see with more chronic symptoms often go back to that of being quite debilitating to them. So what do they do in terms of how we define concussion? What is it that we're really talking about? Well, again, this concussion in sport group, um, updated in 2017, they've met a few times, but this is sort of updated versions of where they're up to, is really saying that it, it has to include a force that goes through the head. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be directly to the head. It can be through the body and then transmitted up to the head, but it doesn't have to be a direct blow to the head. Um, it it has, gives you a, a range of short-lived impairment of, imp of uh, neurological function. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've been knocked out. What it means is that there is some short-term lived neurological dysfunction which occurs with you. And then you may have more, more subtle, longer-term changes in terms of functional disturbance. But it's not structural. So those MRIs and the CTs, you wouldn't be able to scan them and say, this is concussion because those will be normal, so you can rule things out, but you certainly can't rule in um, a concussion when you're talking about those things. So it's really important that we understand what we're talking about and getting those definitions right when we're talking about concussion. So when we think about it, we've got no structural changes, but that's not subtly true when you look down at the cellular level. So in concussion, there are damages which are occurring at the cellular level and certainly in response to the inflammation, so the body's response to that concussive episode. And we know that these have effects on cerebral perfusion, but also cell function as well. And we also know that it happens more in children than adults, and we'll come back to that in a second as well. And 
when I say we couldn't really monitor what happens in concussion in terms of a test, there are things which people are looking at. So we know that when you have an injury of, your, of the brain, um, even in concussion or minor injuries as well, you can see various aspects of markers going up and down in terms of inflammatory markers of, of um, problems. But none of these are really coming out as a sort of lead marker to say, this is what you can do to diagnose this person has concussion or hasn't got concussion. But certainly this is the way a lot of the research is going, is looking for some sort of biochemical marker to help us define exactly what concussion is or when someone has concussion. I want to just return to this idea of the second impact syndrome as well, because it's a lot to talk about it. And when we first started talking a few years ago about um, head injuries, a lot of it was around second impact syndrome. Now, I've worked in, in A&E for about 30 years. God, that sounds scary. But around 30 years and in major trauma centres the whole time. And I've never seen um, a patient with a second impact syndrome of definite. But I do know that if you look at the literature and physiologically, children are definitely going to be more prone to this than anybody else. But what we mean by second impact in syndrome isn't that they're going to have a, a traumatic bleeding type of brain injury. It's the swelling of the brain which occurs. So it's a swelling aspect to which occurs, and that can occur in children. We know biochemically from our previous slides that that can be a cause of it as well. But certainly what... Um, does happen in terms of second impact syndrome is this and going back to that symptomology so what happens when you have a concussion is you do get effects such as slowed reaction times and the problem with that is you're going to re-injure now that could be with the head and it could lead you to a much worse head injury which isn't really a second impact syndrome and a lot of that was described in america through american football but it's certainly we know that players are much more likely to hurt themselves and a good coach would always tell me that they can spot the player who's just not performing correctly and bring them off the pitch earlier than i can and there's always been a debate friendly debate between the coaches and the medical department around that so what do we need to look for when we've got someone? How do we recognize concussion? Well, some of it sounds easy. So if the patient's knocked out, then we've got to suspect that patient is going to suffer from concussion and they should have some sort of medical treatment around sitting them out of those games and returning to play. But sometimes that's quite difficult to recognize, to the truth. And we, we talk a lot about doing sort of video training and things like this, but sometimes it is difficult to tell. But certainly things we look for is when the patient's, the player's not trying to protect themselves when they're going down, if they're not moving for five seconds, if other people are worried, those sort of things. But there's also this idea of tonic posturing and almost like a sort of, uh, a, a sort of epileptic fit which can occur with people who are knocked out as well. It's the ones who aren't knocked out which are sometimes more complicated, certainly for us as on-field physicians, of how we then recognise it. And so the various things we're looking for, including sort of unsteadiness of their gait, um, standing, rising off the ground and things like this. But we know that these only really occur in, in about 27% of, of head injuries. So the most of the head injuries, we don't see such obvious signs that they have had a concussive episode. So what we really do need to do is watch the game, understand the forces which have gone through, and know our players. So it's really important when you're a doctor with a team that you know your players and you know how they're going to react and they've, they've got a change in their behaviour. And that's when you need to recognise and make sure that you're protecting your players going forward. The other way that we start to approach the definition of, of um, the diagnosis of concussion is to use a whole uh, modular of different tests that we can do. Some of these can be done beside the field, some of them take a bit longer. And they've been evolving over time, so we've had sort of SCAT, SCAT 2, SCAT 3, and I think we're now up to where we are, up to SCAT 5 is where we're up to now. And SCAT 5 is really a sort of a standardised way to evaluate someone with concussion. It's actually a really useful tool for us and something we're using more and more. So SCAT 2s and the 3s really had it with sort of symptom evaluation, memory tests, and concentration tests, and balance tests. And SCAT 5 have now added in this idea of a neurological screen and coordination tests. And what you're really doing is, is doing a standardised approach to the player, asking them a series of questions, asking them to go through a series of different functional things, and then working out their score as a result of that function, and then deciding the best way to treat that player.
But this, when we're down at grassroots level, when we're in a park on a Sunday, is not necessarily going to help us. And the real thing here is that it's fine in the Premier League that we can do all these sort of big fancy tests to try and identify them. But if we're in doubt, we should be sitting them out. Because certainly in children and in the park, there's no point in taking that risk. There's no point in trying to have them with further injuries and things. So it's a really important point that that's what we do. When they head to A&E, um, when we see them in A&E, what we're really doing is defining whether they need a CT more than anything else. And again, there's a number of criteria we use to try and decide whether they need a CT scan. Um, and we can go through those. Uh, the one I'd really point out is anticoagulants, which are a real nightmare for us in A&E. And being aware whether someone's an anticoagulant is really important to us. And then once they're discharged from the ED, this is where I think ED needs to wake up a little bit because the advice we're giving, I'm not sure you can read it down here, but this one just suggests that they can return to sport within 24 hours. And as I'm sure we'll hear from later speakers, that really isn't the case. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Julian, and thank you very much, Fortius, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I, I want to take on um, Julian's... Um, messages and, and think about the elite game and how we can get better at making a sideline assessment. I am the RFU's chief medical officer and I do need to disclose that I'm part of the working group um, that developed the rugby sideline screening test um, and um, I'm occasionally accused of uh, therefore having a, a conflict of interest when speaking about it. Um, so I guess here's the challenge. At the community and age group games, it's pretty clear. Um, you recognize and remove. Um, now, um, a head injury event, any symptom of concussion or any sign is enough um, in the guidance to recognize and remove. The kind of challenge is that we know that not all head knocks lead to concussion. Um, and working at grassroots is, if anything, much harder than working at the elite end of the game. In terms of the elite end, um, we've been promoting recognize and remove for many, many years. And despite that, um, when we looked at how effective it was, in 2008, just under 60% of concussed players in professional rugby remained on the field, despite subsequently having a diagnosis of concussion. So we really weren't very good at it. And in the Rugby World Cup in 2011, the average assessment for a concussion was on field and took 64 seconds. So a very brief assessment done in an inadequate environment. So what rugby needed to do was it needed to develop an off-field assessment that would identify cases of concussion and exclude cases that were not concussion. That was the challenge. So in 2011, really your toolbox at that time were the Maddox questions. And um, the Gloucester doctor at the time um, used to talk to this slide. Um, what venue are we at today? I'm fine, doc. Which half is it now? Really, I'm fine, doc. Who scored last in the match? And the player would run away. Um, and then he would try and ask the remaining Maddox questions at the next break in play. So, you know, a very inadequate assessment. Um, what do we have now? So, principally talking about professional rugby, we have cases in the elite game where you're pretty sure that a player's been concussed. You may have seen loss of consciousness, or you may have seen them unsteady. There may be cases where you suspect they might be, and there are ones where they've been exposed to a big head impact, and it's possible. And as a practitioner, you've got to work out which ones you bring off for a sideline assessment, and which ones you let play on and monitor. So um, I think your toolbox is, it, it comprises these uh, tools. Some form of symptom checklist, an assessment of balance, assessment of cognition thinking. If you're lucky, a review of video. Um, impact sensors have been proven to be unreliable. Um, forces uh, you're exposed to don't correlate with clinical outcome and clinical judgment. So that's your toolbox. Um, in professional rugby, how do we define you as being concussed? Well, we say you're concussed if you've been exposed to a head injury event, and either we see permanent removal criteria on the video or in real life at the time of injury, and we pick about 40% of our cases on those criteria. Or when we assess you later on game day, if in the doctor's clinical judgment supported by SCAT-5, he feels or she feels you're concussed, 50%, and we have about 10% who present much later. So that 
emphasises the importance of multiple point in time evaluations. If you're just simply evaluating at one point in time for this injury, you're going to miss cases. Our off field screen happens um, between the event on the pitch and the later game day assessment. And it doesn't really determine whether you're concussed or not. It simply determines whether you should be permanently removed or whether you can return. And there's a fundamental difference here between a screening assessment for return or no return and a formal diagnosis of concussion. Okay, and I'll explore that a little bit. So what do we do at the moment? So as of this season in professional rugby, English premiership, if you come off for a 10-minute assessment, the first thing your doctor does is he reviews the video, which he has in the medical room, and if he sees clear, immediate, and permanent removal criteria, you don't return, and by definition, you're concussed. If he or she doesn't see that, you're then screened with the Maddox questions, some memory and cognition tests that are related to the SCAT-5, a tandem gait test where you walk backwards and forwards along a thin line um, without wobbling in under 14 seconds, and you do your own symptom checklist, and that then informs the doctor's clinical judgment. And he determines, or she, return or no return. So that's what's happening in our current 10 minutes. Just thought it would be useful to give you a few examples of immediate and permanent removal criteria. Uh, so on the left, um, we see an example of suspected loss of consciousness in um, Australia 13. So we'll see it again in slow motion. Um, clear head to thigh. Fails to protect himself when he falls. Loss of head control and doesn't move for at least five seconds. So on video, that would be uh, a permanent removal. Um, an example on the left, um, black 14 is an example of tonic posturing. So again, head collision with his teammate and an arm held in the air. And that's a primitive brainstem reflex that again is diagnostic of concussion in our setting. So we've worked very hard with World Rugby to define 11 immediate and permanent removal criteria. So we're trying to operationalize that Zurich um, that Berlin consensus statement. Um, and I really feel for the team doctors here because this is a very difficult injury to consistently spot. But of the top five, convulsion, tonic posturing, ataxia, suspected loss of consciousness, and clearly dazed, we believe that they can be typically identified on video. The confirmed loss of consciousness we might suspect, but it needs the attending medic to have confirmed that the player was not responsive to make that diagnosis. And 7 to 11, we wouldn't typically see on video, but may be seen by the on-field medical staff. Um, here's a good example of real-time video. This is the Rugby World Cup final of 2015. It's three all. We're 20 minutes into the game. And I want you to watch the Australian player in the headgear make a tackle and his subsequent reaction. So relatively innocent tackle made. player attempting to get up. Um, so struggling to get up off the ground and running off to the far touch line and not his defensive line. And on the basis of that piece of video and our operational definition, he was permanently removed from the game. Now that would be a very hard call to make with that video. So just wrapping up, um, does our head injury assessment work? Um, it's been a touch a sort of a, it's attracted a, a fair amount of negative criticism in its earlier days, and I think we've um, remained believers, but hopefully very objective. Um, we run it in 22 elite adult rugby competitions worldwide now. Um, and remember my initial statement of 58%, that's now fallen to less than 10%. So I think that's very good evidence that this protocol is working. Um, team doctors, get criticized very heavily in the media for when they fail to recognize players who typically have lost consciousness. We review all games and the footage from all games. And actually, the compliance with protocol is 
And I would argue that for a relatively complex protocol being delivered by medical and healthcare practitioners, that's incredibly high. We know, but I'm not going to present today, the sensitivity and specificity of the individual HIA1 assessment components. Um, overall, this assessment in the best hands um, is running at about 90% sensitive and 88% specific. Um, so that's a paper that's under review. But we also know the, the values of the individual components. Last year, we trialed in the Rugby Premiership a, an eye screening, an ocular motor test, the King Devic test, to see if it would add value to the process. And again, that paper is under review. Um, but um, the King Devic test showed real promise in many other settings. And this year, we're doing some work with the University of Birmingham, collecting two mils of saliva to see if microRNAs in saliva might provide an objective test. So that's, um, that's my sense. What does the evidence say? Um, this was part of the um, Berlin consensus, looking at sideline screening, 27 studies. And they said, symptom assessment, King Devic test, and multimodal assessment, so assessments with more than one component, high sensitivity and specificity. Balance and cognitive tests, lower sensitivity but higher specificity. In other words, if you've got a disorder of balance and cognition, it's very likely you're concussed, but you may well be concussed without disturbances of balance or cognition. But the overall comment was these studies were, 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 were poor studies with a high risk of bias. And the conclusion was they couldn't, um, based on the review of the literature, make an evidence-based recommendation for any individual screening test or protocol. So that's rather negative. But what they did say was that the best approach is for a multimodal testing approach, a little bit like the HIA-1, based on consensus aligned to the SCAT-5, and ideally with video. So that's where we're going. So in summary, concussion, as Julian said, is not a unitary injury, and sideline screening is challenging. As you add individual screening assessments, the sensitivity of your tool goes up, but the specificity typically goes down. And as you add more layers to the assessment, it's more difficult for the doctors and the physios to apply in an often chaotic setting. We're increasingly aligning the HIA-1 with the SCAT-5, but the SCAT-5 is just a consensus document, and you need to evaluate it in a real-life setting in well-designed trials, which is what we're trying to do at the moment. We need to collaborate and share across sports because there are multiple difficult pro different protocols. But overall, I think we're transforming this landscape of sideline screening, at least in the elite game. And finally, if you want more details of the HIA1 process, they're on the World Rugby site um, at that email, at that website address. Thank you very much. So good afternoon. I'm obviously a GP, so I, I have to do this in 10 minutes. We do everything in 10 minutes and we never run late, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures. As Julian said, I did used to play rugby at a reasonable level. It's a very rare photo of me holding a rugby ball because tight head props don't tend to go anywhere near the ball. Um, but actually, the, the management of concussion within general practice is, is more around uh, grassroots sport um, and the amateur level rather than at the elite level. And as already, what's already been alluded to is actually there's, there's not a great deal of evidence with respect to the, to the management, particularly with respect to the return to play of concussion. So what we base our management on is, is consensus statements. And I'll be referring to the Berlin consensus statement from, from last year and also the Sport and, Exos, uh, Sport and Recreation uh, Alliance document uh, about managing concussion guidelines in adolescents and, uh, and children. Um, and, and we put together a paper last year as well to try and help GPs in, in translating some of that evidence or some of that recommendation into how to manage concussion uh, within primary care. Um, so I think there are potentially three roles for the GP in managing concussion. First of all, uh, confirming a diagnosis. Uh, secondly, around recovery advice and clearance, and I'll go through uh, that in a bit more detail compared with the other two uh, roles. And then the final one is about referring complex concussions. So the first one, confirming diagnosis. So ideally, the, the player or the sports participant uh, has a concussion that is identified, it's recognised at the time, the player is appropriately removed, 
and it's diagnosed by a healthcare professional at the time or, or possibly in an emergency department. Um, but in reality, certainly in general practice, the patients you see are patients who present still symptomatic. Um, and they'll come in the following week or even several weeks later having not had an appropriate recovery uh, protocol or return and they've still got symptoms. So what, what can we do in 10 minutes? Well, essentially, the first thing to do is rule out anything, more, well, not rule out, or consider alternative sinister diagnoses or serious diagnoses with respect to the neck and the head. Um, and then it's a case, as, as, we've heard, as we've heard, of making a clinical diagnosis, and that's around getting a good retrospective history, which can be a challenge, particularly if there's an element of amnesia um, at the time. But using the SCAT-5 can be very useful, particularly Section 3 of the SCAT-5, which is the symptom checklist. Um, but bear in mind that that has less utility beyond uh, three to, to, to five days beyond po uh, the injury setting, with the exception of the symptom checklist. A neurological and, and neck examination, which may be curtailed depending on time and depending on symptoms. Um, and then explaining what concussion is and, and advice on recovery. And there's some good uh, resources that patients can be pointed towards uh, in terms of uh, ever, uh, uh, stuff that they can look at online. But really, the, the, a big part or potential role for the GP is, is around recovery advice and, and clearance. Um, and that really fits into two uh, two categories. One is around return to play advice, the advice that you give the, the concussed patient. And then also, as, as I'll talk through a, a little bit later, assessing a, a patient or a person before they return to, um, in this instance, contact training, but any sport with a predictable risk of, of head injury. And this was a, an infographic that was part of the paper last year. Um, and I'll just break that down and, and just run through that in a little bit more detail. But this is very much a standard recovery for, a, for a, a, a concussion that is not a complex concussion. And the first part of the, the recovery or the, the return is the recovery, and that is split into two parts. And it's to allow time for adequate mental and physical rest to allow uh, symptoms to resolve. And that in itself is broken down into two elements. Um, within the first two or three days, it's recommended that um, that sports people consider taking time off work and, and school, particularly if they've got symptoms and particularly if work and school are provoking symptoms, but also that they avoid driving, they avoid exercise, and clearly they avoid sports with a uh, risk of, of head impact. Um, and they're also advised to minimise reading and, and screen watching, but there's, there's no evidence that stopping screen watching and reading completely and having a little bit of screen time, a little bit of reading, uh, there's no evidence that there's any difference in terms of symptom resolution or, or longer term outcome. The next part of the recovery process is, is a two week minimum um, where the, they're encouraged to get back to uh, normal activities of daily living. So driving, exercise, reading, screen watching, back to school and work, uh, guided by symptoms, so assuming that they're, they're symptom free. So assuming they are symptom free and they are back at school or they're back at work without having symptoms, then the next part is to try and get the person back to, to playing the sport that they were playing beforehand. And for those of you that are managing concussion, this will be a very familiar graduated return to sporting activity where they will progressively increase the intensity of the activity they're do doing. Adults over 24 hours per stage, children over 48 hours per stage, but again, guided by symptoms. So if there's any uh, provocation of the symptoms, then they go back to the previous, um, the previous intensity, the previous step. And then what's advised is that uh, children and adolescents are reviewed by a doctor and, and also some governing bodies will recommend that adults are reviewed by a doctor before they go back to uh, sports training with a predictable risk of head injury. And GPs often get a bit worried about a review by a doctor thinking they are, they're being asked to, to assess somebody as fit to play their sport. And actually, that's not necessarily what GPs should be asked to do. What they're being asked to do is to re confirm recovery from concussion and check that there aren't any other signs of brain injury. And on, in practical terms, that really means, have they returned to work and school successfully? 
Um, are they symptom free? And have they been following this graduated return to, to sporting activity? Um, and when can they actually return to sport? Well, the minimum uh, the UK guidelines would recommend are 23 days for children and 19 days for adults. Uh, but bear in mind, at the uh, elite end of uh, sport, then that can be enhanced or speeded up if they're supervised appropriately with, with uh, a doctor with expertise in concussion management. So I would actually argue, particularly at the grassroots amateur game, the UK, the, the UK GP is potentially ideally placed to review children and adolescents before, before returning to sport. But interestingly, when we published a paper last year, there was a real um, mixed difference of opinion from GPs as to whether this was actually a, an, a, an appropriate use of their time and whether they actually should be doing or, or managing concussion. And on one side, there was, there was people saying, this is very specialised. Everybody who has a concussion should be sent to secondary care and neurologists. Um, and clearly, that's, that's just not feasible within the NHS setting. Um, and it's a common injury. Um, not just in sport, but also in, in other activities. And it's something that actually I think it's important that GPs should be able to manage the, the straightforward, um, simple, con simple, in inverted commas, concussions. Um, on the other side, there were GPs saying, this is very simple stuff. The, the player, the patient, the parent, the coach can manage this recovery and check that they're progressing through the graduated return to play. Um, and I would also argue against that because this is an injury with potentially serious long-term consequences, although we don't know exactly yet. And I think there's value in having an independent and objective opinion because there's quite often a lot of pressure from coaches, from parents, from the player themselves to get, get back into sport. And actually talking to somebody independently, asking specific questions about symptoms, I think can tease out uh, players who, aren't, uh, who haven't recovered and shouldn't be going back to playing sport with a predictable risk of head injury. There's also an issue around time and not being paid for the service, but you know, sport and activity is a part of everyday life and it's, it would, in my mind, be impossible to expect payment from governing bodies to, to manage each of these concussions. But there are also some, some other issues about GPs being able to manage um, return from uh, concussion in terms of, do, do, they, do they have the, the knowledge transfer from, from the elite sport end where there is knowledge, um, and is there the access and availability for people to actually go and see their GP once they've been concussed? You know, and there isn't a great deal of flexibility in general practice and availability of time, so you know, do people really want to wait another two weeks to see their GP to, to, be, to be seen before they go back to sport? The final one is less contentious, is around referring complex concussions, and clearly if you've got a complex concussion, it's, it's appropriate to refer on to, to secondary care. So in summary, um, there are potentially multiple roles for the GP, um, confirming diagnosis respect, retrospectively, um, the recovery advice and review before they return to uh, a sport with a predictable risk of head injury, and then referring complex concussions. But I think there's a, there's a lot of work that needs to be done for that to potentially happen within the UK with regards to knowledge transfer and, and on getting a consensus about the pathway and how these, these people are actually seen within general practice, considering how busy and, and the amount of limited availability there is there at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to speak. Um, so, uh, the only the uh, I'm not really any major disclosures of interest. And really what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is what happens after a concussion? What, are the, uh, what sort of recovery do we get and how many people don't recover? I'm going to talk about how to assess people that aren't recovering, how to manage them. And then finally, and hopefully I won't have enough time to go about it because I don't know the answer, is how to manage multiple episodes of concussion. Uh, so we'll, we'll go slow near the end. Um, so, this slide uh, essentially tracks a large group of high school and college athletes in the US following a concussion, and essentially, the, you've got the, uh, what is the, thing? the cumulative recovery uh, over on the far column, and you could see that about 20% of people recover very quickly within a day, 
65% recover within a week. There's a prolonged group, about 10% recover within a month. But then only about 2 or 3% of people go on to have chronic symptoms. I'm not really going to talk about who those people are and why, but there are quite a lot, there's quite a lot of work suggesting that there are factors that uh, contribute to that, one of them being pre-morbid psychological status and migraine, maybe not so much about the individual injury, but uh, that's not what I'm going to talk about. So, um, the way I think about concussion, and especially people with chronic symptoms, is that we think about concussion as a brain injury, but the brain's only one bit around the head and neck. And in fact, the brain's pretty well protected. It usually takes the sort, in my more severe brain injury clinic, it's car crashes, it's iron bars to the head that cause severe brain injury. Playing sport rarely does. But what it does do is affect many of these other systems, the neck, the vestibular system, the autonomic system, the visual system, as well as the brain. And the trouble is, if you have uh, injuries to those other systems, you get the same symptoms. Now, this set of symptoms here is what we saw on the consensus meeting, these domains of somatic symptoms. If you removed everything from this slide and put Gulf War syndrome, it would be the same set of symptoms. Chronic fatigue syndrome would be the same set of symptoms. It doesn't tell us anything about the underlying mechanism. And my pet hate, which I'm going to go on about in a bit, is when you start calling this post-concussion syndrome, because it tells you nothing about the underlying cause or treatment. Um, so just to bear in mind that not all symptoms are brain injury. An American neurosurgeon, not, uh, not politician, although it could have been, said, when your brain, when, you, when you've got a headache, it's not your brain aching. <laughs> uh, and he's got a point. Um, so. Um, we set up a clinic at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health for complex concussions, essentially for people not getting better after sports-related concussion. And that was really modelled on the brain injury clinic that we do at the National Hospital of Neurology, which is a multidisciplinary clinic which takes into account the fact that you need a lot of expertise because many different systems can be involved often at the same time. Uh, it's based with a neurologist, a sports medicine consultant. We tend to image most people because by the time we get to us, if they haven't already been imaged, they desperately want to be. And we have a neuropsychologist and vestibular physiotherapist who do most of the work. That's clear rep referral pathways to the other systems we mentioned. And we have wider MDT meetings to go through difficult cases and education. And this is an illustrative case of the sort of people we see. So there's a 21 year old captain of his university rugby team. A head injury during play four months ago, didn't lose consciousness, had no post-traumatic amnesia. Post-traumatic amnesia in terms of uh, a symptom is the best marker of brain injury. So if you have uh, post-traumatic amnesia, an inability to form new memories for more than an hour, that's a brain injury, definitely. If it's more than two weeks, you're not going back to work. Um, since the injury, he'd had headaches, fatigue, cognitive, he'd had the whole list. He couldn't uh, study. He'd ended up dropping out of university for the year. He was getting worse. And he certainly couldn't do any physical activity, which was a massive part of his life. So what do we do? Well, really, the whole key is to assess. He'd been told he had post-concussion syndrome, and it would get better, and he should stop complaining. Um, but the key is to assess what the problems are. And basically, Going through a history is all you need to do. So his headaches were clearly migrainous. I don't know who gets migraines. I get migraines. They're really bad. You need to treat them very aggressively, especially if they're frequent. The other problem is analgesia overuse headaches. So if you take painkillers on more than two days a week, migraine treatments don't work, and you get more headaches. He was complaining of dizziness and visual vertigo. I'm sure we're going to hear more about vestibular symptoms in the next talk. But he had clear abnormalities on examination of his peripheral vestibular system. So there's another thing that can be treated and can be defined. His MRI brain was normal, which was great, because him and his family thought he had severe brain damage. Um, despite having terrible cognitive problems, in fact, a neuropsychological assessment showed that his problems were really all attentional. And attention can be modified by mood, by somatic symptoms. It doesn't define, it isn't a brain injury issue per se. 
And the most obvious thing was by this stage, four months down the line, when he'd gone from being an active, successful chap, he, he was sitting around all day and he was really depressed. So what could we do? Treated his migraines with propanol and stopped his codeine that had been uh, taken religiously. That sorted his headaches out, no problem. Had some vestibular rehabilitation, his dizziness and vertigo improved. And he had cognitive behavioral therapy and his mood improved. And he gradually improved, returned to academic work, non-contact sport, symptom-free. He's not gone back to rugby yet, and I suspect he won't. But I don't think he would have got better had he not have had the right treatment. He probably still would have been labeled as post-concussion syndrome, and everyone would have thought, actually, he's probably now psychologically totally impaired, which I would be at that stage. Um, so really, chronic symptoms after concussion or any mild, minor head injury, you need to define why this person in front of you still has symptoms. Post-concussion syndrome is about as useful as Gulf War syndrome or chronic fatigue syndrome. It tells you nothing about the underlying pathophysiology. In my experience, it's incredibly rare that chronic symptoms relate to brain injury. The three biggies are headache, which is almost always migraine with analgesia or overuse, vestibular dysfunction, which is probably the commonest thing I see, and by the time they get to see me, if there aren't psychological factors, you're probably, I'm probably not concentrating or being empathetic enough. Um, and the way to manage them is very aggressively treating all these individual factors, and you can successfully treat them. Um, there are a group of patients that are resistant to treatment and don't get better, but you still need to manage and encourage a return to normal life, avoid illness behavior, secondary gain, legal implications, medical legal cases, etc. There's a lot of factors I'm not going to talk about. So, um, oh God, I've got hit. I've been too quick. So another group of people that I'm asked to see are either professional athletes or school age athletes who've had multiple concussions. Many of the sports guidelines require specialist input if someone has more than one concussion within a calendar year or a season. And sometimes it feels a little bit like that means that the uh, onus is being put onto me to make a decision. <laughs> And um, I understand the, the issue. There are concerns regarding prolonged recovery after multiple concussions. We know that if you've had a concussion before, it's going to take longer for you to recover. We know there are concerns regarding long-term neurocognitive health from multiple head impacts, although we don't really understand the exact uh, correlation and relationship. Unfortunately, there's an enormous evidence-free zone regarding management, and I'm not sure I know the answer. But what I do is I treat each case individually, rather like, I don't say it's a case of multiple concussion syndrome. I say, well, how severe was each injury? How did the people recover? What symptoms did they have? Did they have another concussion because they hadn't fully recovered because their reaction time wasn't right? Do they have any subtle cognitive or behavioral issues that really would make me concerned about them returning to sport? Do they have risk factors for repetitive injuries? Are they the sort of player that takes risks and goes into tackles when they shouldn't? Is there something that can be done? And something that I'm quite concerned about is if you see people who start getting symptoms from very minor injuries, which suggests they might have a reduced threshold, which is a concern. Um, we end up, if people have more than two concussions in a season, almost always saying they should have a period of rest and avoidance of predictable risk of head injury from contact sport, although we argue about how long Four. So, in summary, only a minority of concussions lead to prolonged symptoms, but if these people are not treated, both in terms of their symptoms and education around the cause of their symptoms, it can be devastating and really chronic. Individual cases differ in causation, but in my experience they're often multifactorial, and aggressive management of migraine, vestibular and psychological factors is often very effective. I don't know what to do with multiple concussions and an MDT helps me in that situation. All right. <laughs> I work with mainly patients who have a six month or more history of dizziness or balance symptoms. And as Julian said, for the military. Okay, so today I'm gonna to really cover very quickly the main points of a vestibular assessment, what vestibular rehab actually is and its role in concussion, and my top tips for rehab of these patients. Get it to work. The objective of any assessment is to inform and guide treatment. With um, vestibular patients, it is absolutely essential to establish what is the cause 
of the ongoing balance and dizziness problems. It helps to apply the most appropriate treatment. And accurate assessment is key. So 30% of patients have a benign positional vertigo alongside concussion. BPPV is not a symptom of concussion, it is a comorbidity that happens at the same time. It's really easy to treat. However, when it is trauma-induced, it's more likely to be bilateral, to involve multiple canals, and need several canalith repositioning manoeuvres. Symptoms can be classified as movement-induced, and that's movements of the head, eyes, and or body, as gaze instability, gaze stability problem, or visual vertigo. Around about 46% of the patients have more than one vestibular deficit, and most seem to develop a visual dependence for balance to compensate for loss of ac accurate vestibular information. Other things to consider, any neck injury, loss of range of movement in the neck can seriously impede cervicoocular and cervicospinal reflexes, and erroneous cervical proprioceptive input to the medial vestibular nucleus can create dizziness in its own right. Headaches have already been mentioned, so have migraines, which is great because I don't like migraines, they are really hard to treat medically, just give them lots of medication works every time. And also with medications, are the patients on any vestibular suppressants? These can really cloud the picture. It's hard to know the true extent of the symptoms if the symptoms are being suppressed. So I'm not going to teach you how to do a subjective assessment. I hope everyone in this room can do one. Um, but the main points are asking what the patient means by dizziness. How do they describe their symptoms? And it's really useful to get them to, to use their words to describe it. So are they feeling hungover? Are they on a merry-go-round? it makes it much more um, easy to, for them to relate. How long the symptoms last, and specifically, what brings their symptoms on? It helps guide your rehab. Uh, also, chronicity. So the longer patients have had symptoms, the more time for maladaptations and compensations <coughs> to have taken place, and it can take longer to affect a change. Uh, short, short bursts of symptoms are suggestive of peripheral vestibular disorder. Constant symptoms may hint at a central cause, and has the balance been affected? And we use the Disney's Handicap Inventory as a screen. So it's a self-reported questionnaire that looks at the impact of vestibular symptoms on physical, emotional, and functional aspects, including sport and work. Okay. So moving on to the objective assessment, a good ocular motor assessment to rule out any problems with the visual system and to also check the inter interaction between the eyes and the ears. Provocative tests to screen for BPPV. We use the roll test regularly in our, in our clinic for horizontal canal involvement. A full neck assessment. For dizziness to be considered cervicogenic, there needs to be an element of neck pain with movement. And then generally, how is the patient holding them, their posture? Is their head tilted to one side? Do they have head on body orientation problems? Are they avoiding moving? And then a bal good balance assessment. There are many, many different balance assessments available. One of the most common in the concussion literature is the BEST, the Balance Error Scoring System. However, this is only really responsive after the, in the first week. The Rombergs is really quick to administer in clinic. Can be a little bit subjective at times, but say very, very quick. And the modified COTSIB is a series of different testing conditions. So the patient have their feet together and then go through eyes open, eyes closed on a firm surface or an unstable surface. And the amount of sway at each condition is noted. And then finally, we use the functional gait assessment, which is a succession of different walking tests to explore the impact of dizziness and balance problems on gait. Uh, for example, walking with eyes closed or walking in the dark is really, really difficult for patients with a visual dependence. Um, and anecdotally, they tend, towards to, to, tend to veer towards the side of a deficit. So what actually is vestibular rehab? This is a great definition by Shumway Cook. It's an exercise-based program. Early pioneers of this were Mr. Cawthorn and Mr. Cooksey, who were surgeons who worked with soldiers after the Second World War. And they observed that patients after labyrinth, labyrinth surgery, who got up and moved earlier and moved more, actually did better. So from this, they developed a series of group-based progressive head, eye, and body movements aimed at promoting habituation, which brings me on to how actually vestibular rehab works. So three main theories, the first being habituation, or desensitization, which is based on the hypothesis that controlled repeated exposure to provoking stimuli minimizes the symptoms. It's brilliant for patients who've got movement-induced problems. Um, adaptation uses the uh, utilizes the concept of retinal slip, that is the movement of an image across the retina, to force an error signal that encourages the brain to catch up and increase the VOR gain. Brilliant for gaze stability and visual vertigo patients. And then finally, substitution, which is promotion of other balance systems to compensate for the loss of peripheral vestibular input. 
We only tend to use it for patients who've got central pathology or a permanent vestibular loss. Okay, so what is the role of vestibular rehab in concussion? Uh, the evidence base, I will say up front, is limited. Um, there is a real lack of clinical evidence from controlled trials due to the heterogeneity of the patient presentation. However, it has been described as the cornerstone of treatment. It can decrease dizziness and vertigo while improving static and dynamic balance. Modified group-based approach appears safe and viable. Getting there early helps rec recovery time. And it is advantageous in improving dynamic visual acuity and balance and gait. As I said before, the evidence is really limited. It seems to be based mainly on clinical, clinical experience, case series, and the application of vestibular knowledge. Okay, so Kathy Aline, I can't pronounce that one, and Emerald Lynn um, over in the States found that majority of patients after concussion with balance problems, their problems were mediated by peripheral vestibular dysfunction. They also found that vestibular rehab was still effective at six to 12 months post-concussion event, which is great for me because that's evidence for my work. Uh, Gurley et al. in 2013 in their literature review um, found that postural control was affected as this is reliant on the sensory integration of vestibular, visual and somatosensory information. They also emphasised the importance of cognition on recovery. Basically, the increased complexity of balance demands increases the demand on the central nervous system and a lot of patients after concussion have significant impairment with balance tasks that require divided attention, such as walking and reading or walking and texting. And then finally, Miller Phillips and Reddy recommended assessing the cerebellum as well, just to rule out any central pathology. So, based on the available literature, the work by Kim Gottschall in America with military patients, and my own clinical experience, these are my top tips for rehab. A graded approach is best, being mindful of fatigue, it needs to be specific, progressive, and timely. Early rest is indicated after concussion, however, rest beyond the first seven days is not necessarily great for for symptoms of dizziness and balance. Early movement is key. You need to be provoking mild to moderate symptoms only. You don't want the patients too dizzy to be able to do exercises or worse, vomiting on the clinic floor. Not pleasant. Um, context is absolutely key. So not only does it need to be relevant to the problem list for the patient, but also taking into account specific requirements for sport and for vocation. For example, in my patient population in the military, visual tracking of a target is an absolute basic requirement of the job. Therefore, we do an awful lot of gaze stability work. Supervised exercises are better than unsupervised, and we also use group work for peer support and socialization. And then do not, really do not underestimate the impact of cognition um, and cognitive symptoms on the ability of a patient to undergo rehab. And vice versa, vestibular symptoms have a massive impact on cognitive sharpness due to the increased mental effort of staying upright and making sense of the world. A successful program should incorporate exercise for the vestibular system, so head and body movements. For the visual system, eye movements against backgrounds of increasing complexity. Somatosensory work. Cardio work is recommended, staying below sub-symptom threshold. And it should challenge balance. So a few little treatment ideas that we find useful. So visual tracking. Tracking a moving object, adding a moving background or contrasting background really takes this to the next level. Cawthorn, Cooksey and Brandt Darif exercises are an excellent starting point for habituation. And with balance, you need to change it up. Change the surface, change the base of support, add in visual tasks, add in cognitive tasks. Be a bit creative. Sensory integration goes hand in hand with balance rehab. And leisure and recreation. We use a lot of racket sports for, uh, for training the patients. They're tracking a moving object while simultaneously moving the body. It's great for normalization of movement patterns and sensory integration, and it is fun. Vestibular rehab is really not pleasant for the patient if you're provoking their symptoms all the time. So we give them a little bit of downtime and some fun. Technology is evolving. So using computer programs, video games, which the guys love, um, we fit. There's some awesome visual flow videos available on YouTube as well. And then a new area in vestibular rehab is aquatic therapy. So the reflection of light on the water, the refraction of an image looking through the water, these add optokinetic stimulation and provide a visual challenge for the patients. The water also provides greater stability for the patient, so they fall around about eight times slower in the pool than they do on land, which gives delayed balance reactions a chance to catch up and to act. And then finally, to summarise, accurate assessment and identification of what is causing the symptoms is key. A variety of treatment approaches and exercises work best. We have a kitchen sink approach and literally throw everything at the patient, including tennis balls. Being creative, 
we have a stash of some hideous wrapping paper for some visual processing challenges. And patients generally make a really good recovery. So our work, we found that 71% 70, of patients who've been through our rehab program have an improvement in scores on the Disney's handicap scale. So the impact of their symptoms is less and 94% of them have in, showed improvement in functional gait. Thank you. I'm delivering a, a talk largely written by Matt Cross, a postdoc who can't be with us today. And what I wanted to do in the last 10 minutes was just to give you some sense of the range of work that goes on to manage concussion risk in a sport, again, rugby, with a high risk. So this is not the model, it is a model. You know, if you're involved in, in a sport at a sort of senior leadership role, you really start by trying to understand your risk of concussion. And the reality is that um, building on the data that Julian showed, which went up to 2012, principally we think as a result of our awareness work, our concussion incidence has really significantly increased. And, and now in professional rugby, there is one time loss concussion every 1.1 games. So if you're thinking about managing risk in rugby at the moment, this is where your focus needs to be. Um, and it's broadly about 20, 25% of all of our injuries. Um, it's about the same percentage at under 18 and school level, but within the community game, so the recreational adult player, it's much less. And that's probably because they play the game slightly differently with more regard for where they put their heads, um, but there's little evidence behind that statement. So I guess if you're thinking about it from a sports perspective, you, you really fall into one of three groups. You're either a sport that doesn't have a significant risk of concussion and you broadly adopt the Berlin consensus principles, um, or your risk is a bit higher and you operationalize them in the way that kind of soccer and rugby and, and hockey have done, or the highest level is you do all of that and you try and collect data and move the knowledge base on. Because actually without moving the knowledge base on, we stay stuck in um, consensus guiding policy. So within the rugby football union, within the professional game, the age group game and the community game, we think about concussion in these pillars. So um, we do surveillance, so we measure the risk in all the levels of the game. Um, we have a large awareness and education program, both professionally and at the community end of the game. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research we're doing. The management um, we, we, we is broadly as per the HIA in the, in the elite game. And I'll talk a little bit about prevention. And we need to work harder and better on communicating what we're doing. But we think about concussion um, against those six pillars. So awareness and education, um, really there are two elements to this. There are online resources that you look to roll out to large numbers of people in the community game, coaches, parents, um, school age players, and our uptake of the head case resource is increasing year on year. And at the top level of the game, our top two divisions, we ask the club doctor to do a face-to-face, -face, one hour interactive session with the players against a standardized presentation. So we're reasonably confident, certainly at the professional end of the game, that our understanding amongst players, coaches, and referees of the issue is high. So lots of emphasis on awareness and education, but that's not all you need to do if you have a risk like we have. So in terms of management, um, within the professional game, this is around making sure that um, your top level elite practitioners manage it well. Uh, there are a small number of them. And this is about giving them protocols and tools. And there's an example of the real-time video that they have within the premiership pitch side to enable them to do that job. It's really important that the professionals manage it well, because if they don't manage it well, you have no chance of selling the message to the community and age group games. Down at the community and age group games, this is really a public health exercise. You're trying to get out relatively simple messages to large numbers of people. Um, with all the pressures from parents and coaches and players to continue to play and return perhaps sooner than might be advisable. Um, and John's talked about the, um, the return to play advice at the community end of the game. So I just want to talk a little bit about research and what's going on. And this is difficult. It's difficult to do research in sport. It involves collaboration between sport, governing bodies, players, and universities. But without doing research, you get stuck without advancing the knowledge base. 
So at the moment, we have, led by the University of Bath, surveillance at all levels of the game. So we can monitor changes in concussion risk. At the recognition end, we scrutinize how we manage at the top two levels with the head injury assessment because the data is captured on an app, it goes up to a cloud, and each week we get metrics on rates and sensitivity and specificity. We've just finished a study looking at whether ocular motor screening, the King Devic test, would add value to our assessment. Um, that's been led um, independently of us and of the um, suppliers of the test, and um, hopefully those results will be published soon. And very excitingly this season with the University of Birmingham, we've got a study looking at whether salivary microRNA would add, um, add to the pitch side assessment and give us a better understanding of the time scale of recovery. Um, within management, we again collect all of the SCAT 5 forms from the top two divisions. So we've got quite a good database as to time scales of return. And we've published on injury risk for non-concussion but musculoskeletal um, injury in the year after return. And it's substantially elevated after concussion. So we're looking into that. The area that we've been most challenged on is what does concussion do to you in the long term? Um, and we've really got two studies going there um, that, um, that are important. We've got uh, 205 over 50-year-olds at the moment coming into London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for two hours of face-to-face -face cognitive tests to try and give us a sense of the potential neurocognitive decline associated with playing international rugby. And we're looking at the psychometric tests that we've collected on our current players um, from the Cogsport database we've built. Um, we also know that we need to do a prospective study, so we're working with World Rugby, our international federation, and a number of other member unions to try and design a prospective long-term player health cohort. So recruit players at 18 or 20 and follow them over their career. Design this in a modular way so it can be done in a number of different countries, but use common data elements so that the assessments are standardized. Um, and that really is the only way um, that we'll get a handle on current risk. I just want to talk um, finally about a couple of the prevention studies we're doing because um, you can do all the good management and education and research around detection that you want, but ultimately we need to try and reduce the risk of this injury. So I want to just talk about two studies. Um, so the first study is a relatively simple one to do, and it involves looking at video of tackles that lost, led to time loss concussion and tackles that didn't. And equally, we have another study that looked at tackles that led to the off-field assessment and tackles that didn't. Two of those three papers have been published, uh, but the high-level finding for rugby is that 80% of concussions occur in the tackle, 30% to the ball carrier, the person carrying the ball into the tackle, and 70% to the tacklers. And if you're a tackler in Premiership Rugby now, just under half of all of your injuries are concussions. So you can start to see where the prevention theme needs to go here. The challenge you have is that lots of factors are associated with increased risk of concussion, um, and you have to do some quite sophisticated stats to work out the relative contribution. Um, I'm very excited here in a paper that hopefully will be published in the next week or two so with the University of Bath, we put a range of risk factors that came out of the video analysis into a machine learning model, and then looked at the error of the model when you took the risk factor out. And that then gives you a sense of the relative contribution of an individual risk factor to the overall risk of concussion. And what you see is that if either the ball carrier or tackler is accelerating, or the tackler is at high speed, um, the model works much less well. So these are the two factors that we think are most important around prevention. Equally, what your head contacts is important. You want it to contact something soft, but it's much less significant than this issue of speed. So when we think in rugby about how we might reduce the risk of concussion, those are the risk factors, fast moving or accelerating ball carrier or tackler, and head-to-head -head contact. Um, it's all well and good for our referees to penalize high tackles. That principally protects the ball carrier, which is a third of the risk. But we need to get our professionals to develop and execute a tackle 
that is dominant so that they accelerate into it and they move fast into the tackle whilst at the same time their risk of contacting their head with something hard is low. And that's the piece of work that we're just about to set off on. Uh, but I think all is not gloomy. Um, so this is a study just published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which was a randomized controlled trial of 40 independent schools, 3,000 pupils aged 14 to 18, who either were exposed to a 20-minute progressive structured pre-training and match play intervention that consisted of running base warm-up exercises, lower limb balance training, targeted resistance exercises, which include some neck strengthening work, as well as some Nordic hamstrings, and a range of plyometric exercises, compared to a standard pre-training warm-up, so an intervention and a control. When we looked at the intention to treat analysis, um, there were differences between the two groups that weren't significant. But when we went to the per protocol analysis, and these are teams that completed the exercise at least three times a week, there was a really substantial risk in overall match injury and um, positively a very substantial risk in concussion. And I think what this says to me is that many of the 14 to 18 year olds currently playing rugby have such a low level of movement control that a relatively unsophisticated intervention um, done over 12 to 16 weeks as this program was done, materially affects their injury risk. So um, there's promise there, and this is now being ruled, rolled out across schools. So where are we now in rugby? Um, I think we've done some good stuff. Um, we've done a lot of education within the sport. We've got good research collaborations coming uh, out. Uh, but we've got this challenge around concussion prevention. As we've heard today, we're short of objective assessment tools. We don't know a huge amount about recovery. We probably don't have the leadership yet from the Department of Health and the Department of Education that we need to get into schools and general practitioners and primary health care with these messages. And um, if all the complex concussions are referred in the way that um, John suggests, the NHS MTBI service provision will be overwhelmed. So there are some resource issues here. So, you know, this is a really substantial problem for contact and collision sports. Um, football are doing similar work, the EIS sports are doing similar work, um, but I thought it was just important to give the audience that are not embedded in sport a sense of how seriously this is being taken. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is uh, Messin Baldu, I'm just a uh, core trainee from Newcastle. Um, my, my question is to the floor actually. I'd like to find out, um, I know there's and not a lot of evidence with regards to connection between concussion and CTE, but could, could you summarise what there is? Um, it's a bit confusing at the moment. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll give an official rugby position and then give Richard a, a non-official opportunity to speak. Um, so I think um, the evidence at the moment is contradictory and immature and Rugby's statement is it accepts that there um, may be an association with the development of long-term neurocognitive problems, um, but further research is needed to um, get a clearer handle on that. So we don't deny that there may be a link. We tell our professional players that there may be a link, uh, uh, and we stop at that point and say that's why it's so important that we manage their acute cases well. I'm glad to hear I'm towing the party line as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, you know, there's undoubtedly emerging evidence that severe traumatic brain injury can lead to a long-term dementia. Um, not in every case. There is certainly compelling evidence from boxing of a condition that now has been called CTE, but the factors that cause that pathology in individual cases are absolutely unclear to me at the moment. Hi, I'm Maurice Mogul, I'm a consultant in sport and exercise medicine with the EIS. Um, questions for Richard. I was interested, uh, apologies if I've got completely the wrong end of the stick, but I think what you're saying is that when you see someone with prolonged symptoms following a concussive episode, so three, four months down the line, their symptoms of headache, uh, dizziness um, and you know low mood or not feeling right are not actually concussive symptoms they're a consequence of the concussion 
and actually the concussion is resolved. Now, if I saw someone seven days post-injury and who complained of those symptoms, I'd say you're probably not ready to start your return to play program. What do you do? If we're seeing those patients, then if I'm seeing that patient, same person two or three months down the line, and they're saying to me, yes, I've got all these symptoms, but actually I feel like I can start exercising again, I can start training again, and I can possibly play again. I think what you're telling me is that actually, as long as I address those symptoms, they're good to go. Have I, have I got that correct? To an extent, yeah. I mean, I think it is difficult. So I think if someone's very symptomatic, saying they can return to play is always difficult. But I suppose you, you know, I, I, I don't deal with other injuries apart from head injuries, but some people have knee pain and, and continue to play sport. And, you know, you worry a bit about their knee, but they still play. Um, I think the point is that I think most of the brain injury resolves very quickly. Um, within 72 hours or a week, or maybe a bit longer in children. I think there are very few cases that you see that have chronic symptoms that aren't one of the things I've said. Now, there are some slightly worrying bits of evidence around biomarkers of brain injury being more raised in people with chronic symptoms. So I might be wrong, we don't have an objective view at the moment. But I think the key is that you need to manage those symptoms and you need to be aware to the possibility that it's not necessarily reflecting a brain injury, but something triggered by a head injury, and have a conversation about return to play. I do think it is difficult to allow people or to encourage return to play in very symptomatic people and people whose symptoms are made worse by doing those things. But I think, you know, we, we certainly, I have some professional players who get migraines that we treat and if they don't take their medication, they get migraines. I certainly allow them to play on medication, which in the past was certainly something that the guidelines were absolutely against. And sorry, can I just add on to that? Are, are the headaches that they complain of typically migraineous, such as you know, visual symptoms before the onset of headache? So migraine, less than 10% get a visual aura or any aura. If you talk to a neurologist about headache, they're migraines. So uh, I sat in with the professor of migraine, and his question, de defining question as to whether someone's headache was a migraine or not was, when your headache's really severe, if you shake your head vigorously, does it make it worse? And I didn't ever see anyone that said no. <laughs> so they all had migraine. The point is that migraine's eminently treatable with lots of licensed medications, and it's worth a go, and they usually are migraine. Um, just, just want to add something to that. So the, um, the latest rugby guidelines have a, um, have a very clear symptom limited activity stage after that initial period of rest. So for our professional players, that initial period of rest, we put it 24 hours and we then move very quickly to symptom limited activity. And in my sports medicine practice, a lot of the, the problems I think I see down the line are because athletes who are used to exercising every day have been shut down for four or six weeks. And you know, building on what all the speakers have said, um, that's increasingly felt to be an error. I think the other point is that you, know, you clearly need to think about what sport your athlete's returning to. So um, I look after the 11 to 16-year-old 11 11 -year dancers at the Royal Ballet School, and I'm treating a, a, a girl who sustained a concussion not dancing. And you know, her return to a sport with an in, incredibly low risk of head injury, raises different issues, and I think you can be um, a little bit more innovative. I think you do have to be wary going off protocol for contact and collision sports, unless you've got a really clear explanation that their symptoms are not brain injury related. Hi, I'm uh, Rich Tanner, I work at the 40th and the FA. Um, just a question about multiple concussions. Sorry to ask about this. Um, in terms of those that are, so the, the episodes are, say you have a player who's had a, a definite contact to the head, you, you expect that it's a high volume, you know, high intensity impact, you expect that's gonna be a concussion, they resolve very quickly. They have a very similar episode again six months later, they resolve very quickly in the anticipated time. Do you think they still need to see a neurosurgeon or are we just passing the buck to a neurosurgeon to clear them? if you think they haven't got any other features? You need to have a think about the specific situation. So in that situation, I mean, my view would be 
seeing someone like me wouldn't add, bring much to the party. But, you know, it could be discussed with someone like me rather than... But, you know, if that person had a prolonged recovery after the first one, then got a second one on the first game back, then yes, I think they should. So I think the trouble with guidelines is they can't cover every eventuality. And to me, the guideline is really just saying, look, multiple concussions is a concern in the... Given the lack of knowledge about the long term, just have a think about the player's safety. But, you know, I think there has to be some individual uh, assessment. Hi, Sam Bach. Um, I'm a doctor that works purely in amateur sport, mainly um, in adolescence. I'm a sports doctor for a number of uh, large independent schools. Um, a number of the speakers have, have touched on it, uh, the, the difficulty of poor information being given um, to athletes, in the, particularly in the early part of um, post, post their injury. Um, in my experience, a lot of that comes from old school attitudes, people thinking they know about um, the injury, but their knowledge being 10, 15 years out of date, which is perhaps not to be unexpected because our, our knowledge has changed so quickly. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, necessarily advocating this myself, but I wonder if any of the uh, speakers think there'll be any merit in, in changing the, the name of the injury so that those old school attitudes um, are, are dismissed. <coughs> I completely agree with them, and we talked about A and E and, and the sort of the written and verbal advice that comes from A and E. And, and if you're lucky, it has anything about sport on it at all. And rather like the one I pulled off the internet, it just sort of says return to sport within 24 hours. So I, I think you're right that people aren't necessarily taking those on board, and also the multiple nature of concussions as well. Um, we sort of see them as isolated instances rather than a sort of spectrum of what I may have heard to that player. I'm just not sure what you would change the name to, is my only, my only question. If you come up with a good name, I would have thought it, it could certainly gain pace. Yeah, I was going to make a similar point. I'm not sure you, what you'd change the name to. But I, I, I also think there's quite a lot of work that can still be done to educate people. And I, I know that talking to people in schools, anecdotally, because of a lot of the work that, that the RFU have done, in terms of educating people within schools that concussion rates, as I say, very anecdotally in other sports within schools have also gone up because they've become aware of concussion and how it should be managed. As I say, that's very much anecdotal, but I think it sort of proves the point that if you can educate people appropriately, then you, you can actually make a difference. I think the RFU have done an absolutely fantastic job at uh, education and um, unfortunately for them, have sort of, as part of that, have taken ownership of, of the injury. I totally agree that now you're seeing the education level rise, people are looking at other sports and indeed non-sport and saying, wait a sec, this injury is, is, is happening all over the place. I also agree that I have no idea what you changed the name to. Um, I, I was just putting it out there. <laughs> so I, um, I mean, just a, a comment here. I think, um, I think we should look to embrace technology rather better than we do in um, managing the return of athletes, pupils after concussion. And, you know, one of the challenges we face in our sport is that, um, is that the coach may have diagnosed it on a Saturday, but how do you get that message to somebody at the school to potentially think about a scholastic adjustment on the Monday? So um, use of apps and web-based technology to share notification and guide, um, guide people who are less familiar to how to manage it is only likely to get more uptake in the next year or two or three. And I know that's an area that you've um, led very effectively on. Hello, I'm a physiotherapist in uh, private practice. And I was just going to ask the panel if anyone's come across um, any patients that have had an altered subjective visual vertical and whether that would be worth um, testing for. Yes. I've seen lots of subjective um, visual vertigo, presumably meaning things that are not coming up in clinical testing, necessarily? Yes, poss possibly uh, f from um, an objective measure itself. Yeah. Um, essentially, with, with chronic patients, you see much less clinical signs. The patients have still got symptoms or still reporting symptoms. Um, that doesn't mean the symptoms aren't there. It just means that they've compensated in terms of ocular motor assessments and things like that. So you, you don't see anywhere near as much nystagmus six months down the line as you would do six days down the line. Um, so that makes treatment a little bit harder. I still treat them exactly the same. 
I still go through the same rehab programme and they still get better. Simon, can I ask a question then? So, I, to, for me, I was very interested in your, your last talk around um, the risk factors going into concussion, and I, and I agree. And also, we've had the newspaper reports coming out recently about banning tackling in children and things like this. So, what, what are your thoughts about this? Do you, do you think that there will come a point when a certain age group won't be allowed to tackle uh, to try and prevent those concussive injuries, especially in children which know a high risk group? Or do you think that will lead to other changes and other things which, which occur, which actually increase concussion, which sometimes happens when you change these rules around? Um, I think um, there are sort of, there are two debates here. One is a broader societal debate about what's an acceptable level of risk to expose um, young people or any sportsman to. Um, and I think there are clearly divided opinions there. Um, the, the thinking at the moment is that um, you have to learn how to tackle in contact and collision sports. Um, within rugby now, there's a very graded curriculum. It looks and feels a bit different to when I guess you and I used to play. Um, and our feeling is that appropriately taught, um, it's important to teach school children to tackle um, so that their lifetime risk of concussion and other injury is, is less. Um, but you know, this is a, this is a difficult argument um, and people hold very strong views either way. Um, it's quite challenging for the Rugby Football Union because we've got a program designed to encourage rugby development in schools. Um, and you know, we believe it's a sport that um, has health benefits um, and it's you know, a sport for all shapes and sizes. So potentially um, children who might not get a lock, lock in in soccer teams people a bit like John can go on to play for their country. Um, but, but we're not glib about the risk. So, um, you know, this will, this will carry on. But we basically think you have to learn how to do to tackle and the contact elements of your sport young, but in a graded way, and you need to be taught how to do it. And it broadly shouldn't be compulsory. Thank you. I was just going to make a quick point about the importance of not just rugby, but other sports engaging with um, the NHS and with the Department of Health, Public Health England, to ensure that actually things like concussion can be managed appropriately, because otherwise there's, there's a certain uh, argument from the other side to say that you've got concussion, it's potentially a serious injury, it should be managed appropriately, and, it, and if we're saying it needs a doctor or a healthcare professional to have some involvement, if there's not that facility within the NHS to allow the children, adolescents, to see a doctor or a healthcare professional, then that's another argument as to why perhaps we shouldn't have contact sports, not just rugby, but other contact sports. Hello, Osman Ahmed, Bournemouth University and the Football Association. Thanks very much to the panel. Really, really interesting session, that. Just one thought I've got is with regard to the media. I know a lot of the topics we've touched upon uh, could potentially be influenced by the role of the media and certainly journalists, things like CTE, education, all those sort of things. What do you think we can do as sports medicine professionals to help with that? Because obviously that could have quite a far-reaching effect on people's understanding of concussion and its management. I mean, I, I, mean, I can answer from, from, a, from my experience point of view, and I think sometimes the media has been helpful, actually, in highlighting some of the dangers from this. But equally, sometimes they can overreact and not necessarily understand all the assessments that are happening in the background around those decisions, and people can jump to conclusions too early on. Um, so I think the, the time now that we've got, certainly in the premiership, both in rugby and in, in football, you've got these ability to rewind and look back at the typical injuries. And, and in Premiership football, we have a very similar system. It's funny, actually, how the two things have evolved, but come from different directions, but the same place. We have a sort of uh, a, rad, a red rag system where uh, the tunnel doctor will inform them that it's, it's red, which basically means they saw them knocked out and you'd be mad not to take them off. And amber meaning, well, it's up to the doctor's decision because you can't quite tell what's happened. And then green, they couldn't see anything that would lead them to believe there was a concussive episode. And again, it's down to the doctor, which sounds very similar to the sort of step outside that the rugby had going down as well. So I think that, that there is an education side to the media for us to say, please, these are the assessments going on. You don't know what's happening at the pitch level. You're not there with the doctor who knows his player very well. And that knowledge of the player, I think, is very important. Um, so, I, you know, clearly, as 
rugby's concussion risk and awareness has gone up. We've, um, we've been on a journey with the media. Um, I think you can't be defensive about what your sport are doing um, because that comes across very badly. Um, your messaging to the media needs to be pretty simple um, and nuances of science don't play out well with the media. So um, you need to have your position really clear on an issue. So we have a series of comm statements. You need to think about them hard and you need to stick to them. Um, I think you only comment on the sports as a sports medicine doctor that you really understand. Um, you know, you, as a rugby doctor, you don't comment on soccer or hockey or other sports. Um, and, and you keep it very simple. And we do a lot of work with the media where we bring them in and we show them how to do head injury assessments. And, you know, and actually, as their understanding grows, their reporting becomes fairer. And they're a really powerful tool for getting the message out there. It, it's not all bad. But at the time, when you think you're doing a good job and the media says you're not, it feels quite bruising. But again, as the sports medicine doctor, you just have to get over that and be a bit tougher. Hi, Phil Sove. I'm an orthopaedic surgeon in Portsmouth. And this is a question really is my role as a grassroots coach at under 15 level. It's a question to John really. You highlighted the difficulty you got with educating the GPs. Would the RFU have any um, thoughts about providing a document which grassroots players could take to their GP or their emergency department, Julian, to, uh, to aid in the diagnosis of concussion? Because at the moment we get players that go off with their parents the next day. They don't really satisfy any of the criteria of concussion, but they get told it could be, and then they're out for three weeks, 19 days. I'm going to hand that back to Simon, if that's um, <laughs> so I, One of the issues here is this, this challenge of communication, isn't it? So um, not everybody is privy to the information that they need to be privy to. Um, do, you, do you want to talk a little bit about a way that commercial companies might help there? Yeah, um, I think uh, so I'm very kindly leading into uh, something I do, which is uh, we run a, a, a software that uh, links up schools and clubs and doctors um, so that everyone can be linked together and the right information is passed on. Um, I mean, that doesn't change the, the reality that the vast majority of people are going to have to um, see their GP or, or, or go to A&E. Um, and in my experience, there's, you know, there's a serious lack of knowledge at, at general practitioner level. Uh, the schools that I work with, um, I say that they should empower themselves and the clubs and the coaches should empower themselves that if they really think that was the injury, then they should stick with it and treat it better. And I think we're in a funny situation uh, with concussion where actually a, a well-educated school or club staff have more knowledge on the injury uh, than, than a lot of us as uh, a lot of the medical professionals, hopefully not, not us in this room. Um, so, so my advice to people is if you really think that there was a concussive injury that happened, then you should follow that up and make sure that they, they get the appropriate care. Um, and I also think there's some work around educating GPs directly because the, the GPs do tend to, to get a bit annoyed or a bit frustrated when they, they get a piece of paper advising something, advising somebody sees them when they don't know anything about it. And actually, you know, GPs are learning all the time. Things are changing and they've got, to, they've got a vast amount of things they've got to, to have knowledge about. So I think there's... There's definitely some, some more work that can be done directly to, to provide resources to GPs to make them more aware of, of the situation around concussion and return to play, rather than them having patients arriving with swaps of papers saying, I've been told to see you, without them having any understanding as to what they, they should be doing. I think the other thing, based on personal experience, I'm very wary about changing a diagnosis of concussion. You know, so uh, uh, with all the evidence that we've seen about the time course and resolution of symptoms, if somebody there who kind of knows what they're looking for saw a head injury event and can describe the, the, the symptoms and signs that Julian talked about, in my book they're concussed and I occasionally get children or young adults 10 days or 12 days later coming to see me with parents to see if we'll reverse the decision so they can play um, and, and I just don't do that. I think, I think the only time I reverse it is when I find that they've had a stroke or uh, <laughs> something much more serious which actually you know it's incredibly rare but unfortunately they tend to gravitate to places like where I am but it's very difficult to reverse the decision of an undiagnosable condition <laughs> um, unless I do have a set of videos of non-concussions but they tend to be vestibular 
direct injuries or anyway. But I agree with that. I think that's our time come to the end. Thank you very much to all our speakers and thank you to the audience as well. It's been a really good session. Thank you very much.